everyone. My name is Cindy Bombard. I am the President and CEO of the Central Connecticut Chambers of Commerce and I want to thank you all for coming here this morning. And I have the great privilege to introduce to you Jay Sadler who will begin the morning off. He is the Chair of the Board of the Central Connecticut Chambers of Commerce and he is a partner in Bloom Shapiro. Jay, come on up. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, before we begin today's event, uh, I would like to ask all of you to kindly uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Hopefully you've all topped off your coffee and you're ready for an exciting morning. The candidates have all promised they're going to behave today. Uh, but welcome to the 2018 Gubernatorial Forum. Uh, it's fantastic to have you all with us this morning. It's going to be a great event. We're excited to uh, be able to, um, to have this for all of you. Uh, and uh, I thank you all for being here, especially the candidates. Uh, I know your schedules must be going absolutely crazy in the next couple of days, so thank you all very much for being here. Uh, I'd also just like to take a quick minute and uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, without their support, uh, today's event uh, just simply wouldn't be possible. Uh, today's sponsors are Webster Bank, Connecticut, United Bank, Bristol Hospital, Tunksis Community College, D'Amato Construction Company, and Farmington Bank. So thank you all very much for your support. So this is a very important day in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I believe this is actually the first time in this election process that I think we have six out of the eight candidates that are going to be on one stage together, so we're excited about that. Uh, but this is important for another reason. Uh, it's very possible that our next governor is going to come from one of the candidates you're going to hear from this morning. I think their ideas and their philosophies are going to impact this state for many years to come. They're going to impact the business community, businesses of all sizes. Their philosophies are going to impact our tax structure and all of us individually. Uh, so I'm excited to hear what their comments are, and uh, it should be a great forum. I'm also excited for today's program because I think today is a great example of the role that a Chamber of Commerce can and should play, not only on behalf of its active members, which is evidenced by all of you here today, uh, but the role it should play in this legislative process and to have a voice on behalf of the business community at large. So again, thank you all very much for being here. It's gonna be an exciting morning. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Cindy Bombard, the Chamber's President and CEO. Cindy? Good morning again, and I can't thank you all enough for taking time out of your busy schedules. We have a few dignitaries in the audience that I would like to recognize, and please wave your hand when I state your name. We have Senator Henry Martin, State Representative Whit Betts. We have Bristol Councilman Peter Kelly, the Mayor of Wolcott, Mayor Tom Dunn, Yetta Uger, the Chamber President from Cheshire. Thank you for coming. We have Phyllis Chabot, I believe he's in the house. He's the Chamber President from Farmington. We also have Rose Ponty, who is re representing the City Hall of Farmington. Roger Picard, the Wolcott Chamber President and Wolcott Councilman. We have from Plainville, the Chairman of the Town Council, Kathy Puglisi, Chairwoman. We have Deb Thompson, who is also a council person at the Town of Plainville. And Deb Hardy, who is the chair of the Board of Education for the Town of Plainville. If I have missed anybody, I apologize. The Central Connecticut Chambers of Commerce, we are the second largest chamber in the state of Connecticut, and I am very proud to stand here and say that. But without each of your participation, we would not be there. We also manage two manufacturing associations under our umbrella. We have the Connecticut Tooling and Machining Association, and Alan Ortner, who is in the audience today, is a part of the National Tooling and Machining Association. Alan, thank you for coming. And we also have New England Spring and Metal Stamping Association, two rather large manufacturing associations that the Chamber of Commerce is very much engaged with. 
It is our job as a Chamber of Commerce to watch what is happening at the Capitol. It, it not only affects what is happening in our businesses on a daily basis, it affects, it affects each one of us. As we walk out of, out of our doors to our employer and we walk into our communities and we walk into our homes and we sit with our families, every single decision that happens at the Capitol affects each and every one of us. That is why the Chamber of Commerce does these types of programs. Our mission statement, businesses working together to promote regional prosperity and community vitality. That is our mission statement for over 100 years. Without one, you cannot have the other. With our strong legislative committee that is run by Paul Lavoie here from Kerry Manufacturing and Kurt Bowers, the president of the Bristol Hospital, we can assure you that your voice, our voice, will be heard, whoever the governor is, we will be at your door. I would like to now ask Kurt Bowers to come on up. He is the president and CEO of the Bristol Hospital to come and say a few words. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jay, Cindy, thank you very much. And thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I heard Jay this morning said to me, this is the first event this week that he's been to. There was actually air conditioning, and he was referring to the hospital's event where we all went home and changed afterwards. Um, so um, I was asked to say a few words about um, the legislative committee at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, one of the things that it does is it plans things like this, this, this forum uh, this morning. And there's a lot of care that goes into it. I think we had, I can't tell you how many meetings and emails that went around to set this, this agenda up for this morning. Paul, the team, did a phenomenal job. Um, and one of the things I noticed when I came up here this morning was they were so concerned about fairness, they actually added pads to these chairs because they're shorter than the other chairs on the other side, right? I mean, really attention to detail. <laughs> So the role of the Central Connecticut uh, Chamber Legislation Action Committee, it's a mouthful, is to represent the interests of the businesses that, we, that are our members uh, to our state lawmakers. Our committee provides chamber members with access uh, to legislators and policymakers in order to improve the business conditions in Connecticut, um, something that we all really uh, need to have happen. We also work to support legislation that will provide manufacturers with skilled workers through educational programs and training. Additionally, we aim to reduce the cost of doing business in Connecticut by advocating for lower state taxes. We owe much of our success uh, to, the, to the engagement uh, and involvement of our local delegation, many of whom are here today uh, that were, were uh, recognized. We are grateful their, for their guidance and continued partnership. They come to just about every meeting, which is uh, exciting, except for when we plan things like this. Um, I'd like to introduce this morning's moderator, um, my partner, partner in crime, over here. Paul Lavoie. Uh, he's the general manager of Cary Manufacturing as well as the vice chair of the Chamber Board of Directors uh, and the chair of our regional legislative committee. So, Paul, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you, Kurt. Uh, the Legislative Action Committee of the Central Connecticut Chamber of Commerce is a bipartisan committee of business leaders from our region. As Kurt said, we represent the business interests of the Chamber and we work with our municipal, state, and federal elected officials to ensure a business-friendly environment. It's our belief that one of the paths to prosperity for Connecticut is job creation. We need more people working, paying taxes, not the same people paying more taxes. Business is the engine of job creation and we advocate for business policy that supports job growth. You see, at the Chamber's Legislative Committee, we don't see politics in terms of red or blue. We see them in green, which is the color of money. <laughs> so thank you to our candidates for participating. We applaud your courage to run for governor, and we look forward to learning more about you and your vision for Connecticut. Now, yesterday we did a random drawing to determine the seating arrangement and the order of the opening and closing statements. I'm going to welcome to the stage the candidates in the order of that drawing, and we will do closing statements in reverse order. So please join me this morning in welcoming our candidates. Joe Gannam. Sure. Oz Griebel.
Steve Upsitnik. David Stemmerman. Bob Stefanowski. Mark Bowden. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, you'll find microphones uh, available to you as well. So if you please, we've got three, um, so we'll share. And um, let's get started. So I'd like to, like to review the ground rules for today's forum. Each candidate will be given an opportunity to give you a three-minute introduction. Chris Boyle, who is the Director of Public Relations for Bristol Hospital, serves as our official timekeeper. You'll notice there are timing devices here at the red table. You will have three minutes and not a second longer. You will receive a 30-minute <laughs> warning in the form of a yellow light. Those of you that have watched me moderate a debate before know that that was true. When the red light goes on, you will be interrupted and you will be cut off. Please understand that I do not do that to be rude or disrespectful to you. In fact, it's the exact opposite. I do it because out of respect for the business community, uh, who is on a very tight time schedule, but also to be fair to all of the other candidates. So please, I ask you once I say thank you very much and move along, uh, to please be able to participate with us. Our Legislative Action Committee has developed four questions. We've done this in committee and we've reviewed these. Each candidate will be asked two questions, and you'll have two minutes to answer that question. Again, in determining who is going to answer the questions, we did a random drawing, which our Katie D'Agostino did the drawing, and Cindy Bombard and Chris Boyle, the uh, firm of Bombard and Boyle, were uh, there to verify the accuracy of us pulling the name. So. So you'll have two minutes to answer each question. At the end, you'll have a minute for closing statement, and we'll go in the opposite order. So let's get started with our opening statements. Uh, Mayor Joe Gannam, you drew number one. So welcome to Central Connecticut Chambers. Well, let me. Is it on? Yeah. I don't know. Yep, you go. Let, let me say. Yeah. Let me say first. It's my my, my pleasure, uh, honor, to join you and um, so many from the chamber what's an important time for us in Connecticut. Certainly as business leaders, as, as just resident citizens about the future of our state, and nice to see so many others that are vying uh, for the office of governor. Um, one thing somewhat disappointing um, is that my opponent in the Democratic primary failed to show. Um, I, I don't know what, what the reason is or what the reason was, but uh, I have no problems. I'm a pretty straightforward guy, uh, lighthearted or not. I think we should call him up and find out why he's not here. Um, and, uh, you know, this is important, but, uh, just give me a second. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, really. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Look, this is, Connecticut is a great state. It has great potential, great opportunity. But there's also a state with, with terrible inequality. We have almost two Connecticut's in many ways. Some with the top 1% who seem to ride on the top, whether the economy's good or bad, whether there's jobs or whether there's high taxes or whatever, and there's, in some ways, the rest of us. I want to build a new and better Connecticut economy that works for everyone, not just for the wealthy few. And to do that, in many ways, it starts with really having a focus on, an understanding of, an experience on what it takes to get an economy going. I've been mayor of a large city now 14 years collectively. The last two and a half as a comeback story, coming back into taking over the state's largest city, Bridgeport, and bringing in almost a billion dollars of grantless growth and investment with jobs and businesses coming in from out of state into our state, but into a city, which are often very difficult. It's experience like that that Connecticut needs now in order to get our economy going. We're never going to cut our way or, or tax our way out of this fiscal mess. Um, if you look back, again, focusing on my experience on a local level, and there's others here who certainly have been in public service before, and I think that's important. But at one point, I had a job as a very young mayor of taking a city with a worse fiscal crisis than we have now on a state level, on a local level, with that city being bankrupt. 
and working in partnership with the business community, with labor leaders, with grassroots organizations and different levels of government, we're able to quickly put it back on solid fiscal ground. From there, I know you're, as we all are, tax sensitive, hold the line on property taxes for 10 years in a row. And with it, see public and private partnerships for investment, whether it's a ballpark, arena, or downtown, a waterfront development. And now, more recently, uh, with $400 million in investment. Thank you, Mayor Gatt. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was serious. Um, Joe, you apparently have not yet met Cindy Bombard. I can, uh, I can tell you that if a candidate wasn't here, it wasn't because they didn't know about it. So uh, <laughs> you haven't met, uh, again, if you haven't met Cindy yet, trust me. Uh, so uh, even up to, I think, 4 o'clock yesterday. Yeah. Still not coming? Yeah, still not coming. So um, OK, next up, Oz Griebel. Uh, wherever you'd like. You want, yeah, here you go. It should be. Good morning, everyone. Joe, I, I, I just want you to know, Ned sent me a text. He had locked his phone in one of the bathrooms. So. <laughs> good, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to Cindy, Paul, and everyone else. It's great to be here uh, with this group and, and share the stage with the other uh, candidates. My name is Oz Briebel. I'm running with Monty Frank as an independent on an independent ticket. Uh, and we're running because we believe the two-party system is fundamentally broken and only an independent governor can bring both parties together, leaders from both Republican and Democratic parties, together with the private sector. I've been in the state 25 years and my view is that everybody tends to stay in their silos. Uh, hospitals stay in theirs, businesses stay in theirs, elected leaders stay in theirs. And the need to bring uh, our most important asset together, which is our intellectual capital, people like you in this room, be part of the discussion of making sure we're defining the issues correctly, and more importantly, identifying and working together to, uh, to address some of the impediments. Uh, we've said that, uh, Monty and I have said that every decision we make, starting with the first budget that we submit next February, which will be without question the single most important document that we submit, that all the decisions we make will be seen through the prism of whether that decision, individually or collectively, will enhance Connecticut's ability to increase on a net basis 200,000 private sector jobs in 10 years. We've had no net job growth in 30 years. Uh, we lost 120,000 in the real estate implosion back in the 90, uh, 89 and 91 period. Took about 12 years to get them back. Lost 120,000 jobs again uh, in the uh, Great Recession of 07, 08, and we've got recovered maybe 100,000 of them. To the point that Paul made earlier, yes, we need more people in the state paying more taxes and contributing their intellectual capital uh, to the uh, to this great state. People say, well, how are you going to do it? You can debate whether 200,000 is aggressive enough, uh, and I'm per perfectly happy to see that number go up. But that number compared to zero over the last 30 is a significant step forward. We'll do it by being the chief marketing officer of the state of Connecticut. Uh, I've said back in 2010, and I'll say it again now during all the years I was at the Alliance, the governor is the one person who has to serve as the chief marketing officer dealing with the employer base that is here today. If you believe in the adage, that your next best customer is your current customer. It means spending time with people like you on a regular basis, either in forums like this or on an individual basis, to make sure that you know you're appreciated, that the jobs you have here today are valued, uh, that the taxes that you and your employees are generating are valued, that the investments you're making in the state are valued. And you only do that by, by, by meeting with people on a regular basis. We'll have a chance for a few questions today. I've met with several of you at your places of business or employment and would welcome the opportunity to continue the discussion in greater depth as we go forward. So thank you very much for the opportunity for the opening statement and the rest of the morning. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Steve Upsidnik. Yeah, good morning, my name is Steve Upsidnik. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself, my plan for Connecticut, and what I think we can do together. I grew up in Stanford, I attended the U.S. Naval Academy, I did my submarine service down the road in Groton. And when you find yourself in life, like I did, about the height of this room under a 10,000 ton Russian submarine, you realize in life that there are more important things than self-interest and special interest. What matters in life is the mission we are on. And I'll define a mission for us in a few minutes. After I got out of the service, I met my wife at the Wharton School of Business, and before we came back home, because she was from Connecticut, we said, let's go to California and see what's so special about how they build businesses out there. So I've been fortunate that I've worked with some great people creating great companies. One of those companies is probably in your pocket. That woman, Siri, who talks to you, and I apologize, she's not perfect. After that, I started a manufacturing business. We make smart antennas for AT&T and Verizon. 
I'm the only product maker in this business. I am the only manufacturer running for governor. I'm the only person who's probably been a member of a chamber of commerce. So I understand what you all are dealing with every day. Since I graduated from high school, this state has created 5,600 total net new jobs. That's horrible. So what my mission is, if you choose to accept it, is a five-step plan to build 300,000 jobs over eight years. Five plus three equals eight. It includes targeted tax reform, hugging the customers of Connecticut we want to keep here, seniors, working folks, and businesses. It talks about $3.5 billion in detailed spending cuts. Go to my website, steveupsetting.com. My detailed plan is there laying it out. And the third thing, it talks about innovative ideas like career corridors. How do we take our 42 colleges and trade schools who are here, our 24 Fortune 1000 companies who have not evicted themselves yet like GE, and how do we break down the silos between business and institutions so that we can build businesses again? That's my focus. I, d I believe you deserve a person of character who grew up in this state, served in the military here, has created good paying jobs, what you all do every day. You need a fighter that will mobilize the resources of this state once again. We can do this. Help is on the way. And for the Republicans in the room, August 14th, I ask for your vote. And for the rest of you, November 8th, I guess, I ask for your vote then. Thank you. Thank you very much. David Stemmerman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to introduce myself with three things I'd like you to know about me. First is I'm a family man. My wife and I are married for 20 years. We got five children. I got four teenagers in my house. Second thing you should know about me, like all of you here, I come from a business background. I started my own business, an investment business, from a single desk in 2008. Not exactly the easiest year to get started. The third thing that you should know about me is I believe in the promise of the American dream, that with hard work, each generation does better than the past. We have an important decision to make, first for the primary on August 14th, and then in the general. And I want to give you three qualities that I think are critical. The first is, who has a real, not only vision for what we want to accomplish, but a plan of how to get there? We were endorsed by the Hartford Current for the Republican primary as offering bold and ambitious plans that are achievable. We've done the math. And we have posted on our website, davidstammerman.com, multiple plans. So if you want to see it for yourself, go do your homework. Nobody likes to do their homework over the summer. Go do your homework. The second thing is we have a lot of very difficult decisions ahead of us. The governor is handing over a horrible legacy to his successor, an $11 billion budget deficit over the next 10 years because of a $100 billion unfunded retirement liability. I'm the only candidate in either party that's talking about this issue seriously and realistically. What we say is you can't reform those liabilities and those agreements. You must restructure them. And I say that whether I'm talking to a union uh, worker whose retirement has never been properly provided for, or a taxpayer who's guaranteeing benefits that they can't afford to pay, or to our children. I don't owe anything to anybody. I've made my money. I'm not making promises or pledges that I can't keep. The base of any relationship, whether it's your marriage or your business, must be built on a foundation of trust, a foundation of honesty, we have had a dishonest government for decades, and we'll bring something very different. The last piece that I'll talk about is bringing us together. The challenges that this state faces are too great for any one person or any one party. We need someone who is going to ultimately bring us together. I was in Joe Gannam City marching in the Puerto Rican Day Parade, and I must say there are more Republicans on this stage than there were on a five-mile parade route. But they all thought that we were in trouble and we need something better. And it's we. We want more jobs. We want lower taxes. We want better schools. And what we need is leadership who inspires all of us who will get that done. This state used to be the best place in the country to live, work, and raise a family. With the right leadership, it can and it will be again. Thank you very much. Bob Stefanowski. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I was uh, finishing up my eggs over there, listening to the opening comments. Uh, lower taxes, less regulation. I said, this is my kind of crowd. <laughs> uh, I'm a business guy. I grew up in New Haven, uh, went to the public schools. I spent the majority of my career at General Electric. 
I started as an entry-level person, worked my way up to be a company officer. It's a company with 300,000 employees, and uh, I learned from one of the best, Jack Welsh, uh, the CEO. Um, the other part of my career was with uh, UBS Investment Bank. I was the chief financial officer. We had a $500 billion business over 35 countries. Um, so I would submit to you, and we've got a lot of different types of candidates, I would submit to you that we need to start running the state of Connecticut like you guys run your businesses. Um, we are not a charity in this state. We need fiscal responsibility. Uh, we need discipline. We need leadership, and that's exactly what I've done throughout my entire career. So my plan involves a few elements, um, and I've been beat up by the press. Um, I see a few of the press people over there. Uh, we need to get rid of the state income tax. We absolutely have to do it. People say it's impossible. Well, how is something impossible when we already did it? Before the income tax came in by Lowell Weicker in 1991, Connecticut was the fastest growing economy in the entire nation. In the 25 years since, we're almost at last. We're the only state that hasn't recovered the job loss from the Great Recession. We absolutely have to do it. The next question is, how do you pay for it? When I was the CFO of UBS, we introduced zero-based budgeting. I had every department come in. I said, I don't care what was in your budget last year. It's zero. How's that for an idea? And we only added back in what we absolutely had to have. We took out a billion dollars of cost in my first 12 months there. We can resize government. We need to renegotiate the CPAC agreement, the, the State Employee Pension Plan Agreement. It is too big a drain on this state to be sustainable. And we're not being fair to the union employees either by making them promises that we can't deliver. Those checks are going to start to bounce. We need to reprioritize. We spend too much money on buses from New Britain to Hartford that three people are on when we could be investing in our schools and our education. And we need to focus on the skill set. Small and medium-sized business is the backbone of the state. And I was surprised when I went out. It was tax policy, but it was also access to skilled labor. Here we are in a state that's essentially bankrupt, and we got more demand for graduates then we have supply. We need to work with the trade schools. We need to lower regulation. We need to get rid of the state income tax. We need to reduce the corporate tax. We need to reverse what Dan Malloy has been doing for the last eight years. I'm the only candidate who has the experience to do it, who's run an organization anywhere near the size of Connecticut. And we need leadership. We don't need excuses about what we can't do. We need a leader of this state who's going to tell you what we can do. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Bob. Mark Bowden. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Bowden. I'm mayor of the city of Danbury. It's my honor and privilege to be here again and to uh, address you uh, as we get close to our primary day uh, next Tuesday, as well as a general election uh, later in November. Now, look, I could spend my three minutes telling all of you here how bad things are in the state of Connecticut. And I could go through all of the list of lasts that we've managed to win. But then that really wouldn't be a victory for any of us, and you already know the story anyhow. So I'm here today to tell you a little bit about, and talk a little bit about what our future can be. Because at the end of the day, elections are never about the past. They're about the future. And if we spend all of our time focusing on the past, we're never going to be able to see our future. And I will say this about the times that we live in. This is the Connecticut moment. This window that we face over the next 18 months are critical for the future of our state. This is our time. It's not our time. It's our time to be able to make the changes in our state that we want to be able to make so that we can prepare for the 21st century and for the generations that come after us. So shame on us if we don't take advantage of that opportunity. Yes, we're in fiscal disaster. We lurch from budget crisis to budget crisis, but the reality is that this opportunity in front of us only happens once in a lifetime. So we're gonna, we have to be big and we have to be bold in our proposals. We have a proposal to phase out the state income tax over the next 10 years. And I know what you're saying, you're sitting there rolling your eyes and saying, I've heard that before, it's never gonna happen, how are you gonna get the money, all that stuff. This is our time to completely reorganize state government, to create a government for the 21st century, not the 19th century. And if you think that the status quo is the best we can do, then you can never eliminate the state income tax. We can't talk about repairing the pension system. We have to talk about ending the state pension system as it currently exists. It is unsustainable and unfair to hire people that will never be able to pay the bill for it. And finally, I want to tell you that the city I come from, under my leadership, 
using conservative ideas and conservative philosophies has made great strides. We have the lowest unemployment rate in the state. We have one of the lowest effective property tax rates in the state of Connecticut. Our mill rate is 27 and change. Compare that to any other major city with the exception of Norwalk and Stanford and the state of Connecticut. We have the lowest sewer water rates in the state of Connecticut. We were just named as one of the best places to start a business in the state of Connecticut. And just this last week, our Main Street was named as one of the top 10 Main Streets in the state of Connecticut. That happened with the city government that ranks 159th in city spending. That's how you bring efficiencies to bear. That's how you pull people together. And that's how this state ought to be managed. God bless you and God bless America. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Nutmeg TV is here uh, today, and they're recording this forum as well. So it'll be available online um, for those that can't make it or those that want to see it again. So, um, and that was, uh, their services have been sponsored by Thomaston Savings Bank. So thank you to Thomaston Savings, Savings excuse me, Thomaston Savings Bank uh, for putting that together for us. Now our questions. So again, we chose uh, random participants for this question. So this question is for David Stemmerman, Mark Bouton, and Bob Stefanowski. So you will have two minutes, uh, gentlemen, to ask this question. Uh, David, you will be up first. Uh, earlier this year, the legislature named a commission to study the fiscal status and economic growth issues in the state of Connecticut. And they presented their findings to our governor and to the legislature. What is your opinion on the report of the Commission of Fiscal Stability and Economic Growth, and would you implement their recommendations? David, two minutes. So the Commission did a very important piece of work for us, which is they, for the first time, did a deep dive to help us understand what the depth of that problem is. It was co-chaired by Jim Smith, who ran Webster Bank, and Bob Patricelli. Uh, Bob Patricelli is now a part of our campaign, uh, and I have read every single word of the 159-page report, including five appendices. And if you look at our website, where we now have six of our own proposals, we quote very generously and cite very generously. And what they've done is they have identified how serious this problem is ahead of us. Uh, the, the beginning of it said, the more work we do on this, the worse it seems. Uh, and so the problem is catastrophic. We had Bloomberg News say, we are at risk in this state of defaulting on our debt. In terms of what they then proposed, though, uh, there's a lot there that I don't think uh, gets the job done. And the reason it doesn't get the job done is unless and until we restructure our retirement liabilities, we can't cut a single cent of taxes. We can't do any of those things. And when I spoke with one of the people who did the work on that analysis, I said, you know, all that you're proposing, even if we did everything, we still as a state are bankrupt, right? And he said, yeah, the answer is right. And so the signature first plan that we put forward was not just that we need to do something, but how to do something about it. And what we model our plan on is what was done for the big three auto companies after they went bankrupt. What they said is, we can't pay you everything that you've been promised, but we need to make sure that your retirement is secure. And they created an independent, locked, privately managed trust. Those retirees are no longer paid by GM, they're paid by Prudential Financial Services. We've put forward a plan to do exactly that. It's on our website. It is the essential first step if we want to cut taxes and grow jobs, which is what we all want to do. Thank you. Mark Bowden, two minutes. Yeah, I have read the uh, report and I'm familiar with its recommendations. And um, I think the benefit of that report and the hard work that was put in by Jim Smith and Bob was that it pointed us to what some of our real long-term systemic challenges are within state government. But I do disagree with some of their discussion, and I also disagree with some of their recommendations. The first one is, I disagree with the concept of tolls. I will strap myself across I-84 before I let a toll be put in this state for a variety of different reasons. One is because our problem is not just a financial problem, it's a culture problem of spending at the state legislature. We have a spending problem in as much as we have a revenue problem. And until we understand that every time this legislature sits down to meet, led by the Democrats, sorry Democrats in here, we love you, led by the Democrats, 
The reality is, is that there are new proposals that come up and wacky ideas that come up that either get pushed down to cities and towns or create more programs and more spending. So we need to change the culture of how we look at government and what government is for before we can implement things like tolls and other things and other revenue ideas there. But I also want to point out that that report recommends a lowering in taxes in a variety of ways. One of them is the state income tax. They agree with us that that is a drag on our economy, has been a drag since 1991, and since 07 we've had almost, we've had negative growth there in the state of Connecticut. So some of their uh, assessments are similar to ours in terms of what needs to be done. To stimulate growth in the state first, to generate the revenue second, we need to cut taxes and we need to do it now. We need to make it easier for you to do business. We need to clean up our permit process to make it simpler for you to go out and get permits. All those things have to happen concurrently. You can't do one and then wait the next step to do another, another, another. Our patient is in critical condition. It'll be up to us. To Thank you, it. Mark. Bob Stefanowski. So um, I've met with Jim Smith and some of the people too. I, I'll start by saying I admire what they did. You know, they all have full-time jobs. They cared enough to get into this, look at it in detail. But let me ask you, if you were running your business and you had a problem, would you do a hundred page report, several hundred page report with 15 appendices and then have it sit on a desk for six months? And one of the recommendations is to hire McKinsey for another six month study to figure out how we're going to take out costs. We don't have time for this. It's the perfect example of government versus the private sector. We don't have time for studies. My first week in office, I'm going to call a fiscal emergency. Be a state of emergency, not because a hurricane's coming, not become a tornado's coming, but this state is in an economic crisis right now. We've done enough analysis. We need to sit down with the union leaders. We need to talk about restructuring the state employee agreement. We need to have some hard discussions about Hartford. I'm afraid to say it, but I think we probably need to look at filing Hartford for bankruptcy. And that doesn't mean I don't want a vibrant Hartford, but we're putting good money after bad rather than having the tough decision. Detroit went through it, they came out the other end. If we don't get somebody in here who's a true leader that's going to take action rather than doing thousand page policy papers, we're in trouble. Look at Dan Malloy. His parting gift to us is a $10 million study on tolls that nobody wants. And the press and everybody else spends three weeks talking about tolls when we should be talking about reducing taxes, making it easier for you guys to do business, reducing regulation, cutting costs, and getting on with it. This is therapeutic for me. I can I get my frustration. So I, I, I've been in politics for seven months. I've never seen anything like it. We've got to get on with it. Enough studies. We know what to do. We need leadership. We need somebody who's done it. We need somebody who's run an organization the size of Connecticut that can effectuate that change. Thank you very much. Question number two. So this question is for Joe Gannam, Oz Griebel, and Steve Obsidnik. Our legislature has introduced statutes and laws to make Connecticut a right-to-work state. For those of you that don't know what that means, a right to work law guarantees that no person can be compelled as a condition of employment to join or not join, nor pay you dues to a labor union. Our question for the three of you is, what's your position on right to work? Joe Gannon, two minutes. Thank you. Um, no, I don't support that. I do support the uh, concept of and the relationships between management and labor and labor unions and the fights that they've had to, uh, to take away or I should say to rid us of some uh, un unsafe and conditions uh, that were prevalent before unions were around. Now, saying that means that I understand the dynamics of management and labor negotiations working together for a common good and a common goal and I've done that. I work presently with 13 municipal labor unions and have uh, spanned it over some 14 years with success, even in the midst of the backdrop which I mentioned earlier. Uh, the concept of bankruptcy for a municipality is, is not, not the answer. Um, it comes from the private sector, sometimes you may not understand the dynamics of the impacts of a large public service entity like the city of Hartford or Bridgeport or even the state of Connecticut and the sensitivity of some of the needs that are addressed there and how that would, would, would devastate and cause further crisis. The better approach, I will tell you, even though it was some years ago, there was a filing for bankruptcy with an attempt to break union contracts in our largest city. I would do that where we would sit around the table, negotiate tough, tough, tough at times on health care and on pension contributions and on wages 
in a, a safe and good work environment. And, and, and the difference is the results of, 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 of hard work, certainly, um, but respecting individual men and women who work in the public sector or in the private sector, as the case may be, in order to get the job done. So my approach is different. And it's with a better understanding of having experience in the public sector, having worked with, sometimes in difficult, uh, uh, head knocking, but ultimately with positive results for the people that I serve. That's what I'll do as the governor of the state. If you give me that opportunity, we'll get through this uh, one way or the other with our, our partners in labor, in management, with business leaders as well, and uh, put the state back on track the way we need to. Thank you. Thank you. Oz Griebel. Thanks, Paul. Uh, to be honest, I've not given a lot of thought to this issue. My instinct is that I'm in favor of the, uh, the right to work concept. Uh, but in this state, just to play off some of these earlier questions, the challenge uh, with union leadership is more in the public sector than it is in the private sector. I've lost track of what the numbers are in terms of unionized workers in the private sector, but it is a number that's a lot less than it was uh, 25 or 30 years ago. I want to just play off a couple of the other questions to get at this issue of the public unions because I think that's what we've all talked about in terms of it gets to the pension. And a couple of things that came out of the, uh, out of the Fiscal Sustainability Commission that are valuable uh, was a recommendation to contribute the lottery, for example, uh, to the state uh, to the state pen to the state teachers pension fund. There was also a presentation not recommended that we securitize state-owned assets and contribute the proceeds of that to the state employee uh, pension fund. I think those ideas have real value because you begin to shore up for the current uh, pensioner that they is there is there is a pension check coming down. I'll be in a room like this and say, anybody here is state retiree? And if the hand goes up, I'll say, you're getting your pension check, and they say yes, and they say, how confident are you you'll get it in 20 years? Some people will say I'm entitled to it, others will say I'm skeptical. Be skeptical for all the reasons you've heard up here earlier. If we contribute those kinds of assets to both of those funds in exchange for work rule changes when the, when the negotiations come up in 2020 on work rules and base comp, where we can begin to move to privatize certain services that we as taxpayers believe we need to support but don't need to necessarily be delivered by uh, state employees, whether that's DMV, whether it's DECD, whether it's some of the agencies uh, like DEMAS that provide critical services. There are ways to get at this issue where we have to be more nimble and more imaginative. And to me, sitting down and working with the public sector leaders, to me, is critical both on CBAC and in trying to move to a more leaner, more efficient uh, state the delivery of state services. Thank you. Steve Upsidnik, two minutes. Uh, my grandparents and father immigrated from Czechoslovakia in 1938, six months before Hitler rolled through. My grandfather worked in Heasley Mine Number no. 3 in western Pennsylvania. He died of black lung disease. I never met the man. The unions had a role at time in our history to protect people, and I get that. But what's happened in this state is we've gone so far to the left with career politicians and union bosses making promises that have taken this state down a road to ruin. Right to work is a key right that the people of Connecticut should have that will restore the ingenuity, creativity, and innovation that has led this state for far too long. So I support right to work. Kentucky, I think, is the latest state to, to enact it. And they saw $9 billion of private sector investment come into the state within the first six months. $9 billion. So this is broader than, than just um, yeah, the public sector unions and private sector unions. This is about what we need to do to take our innate abilities and rights to inspire ourselves to build an economy. My five-step plan to build 300,000 jobs over eight years relies on the ability of getting people into the private sector growing our business. Because for 40 years, we haven't grown uh, private sector, we've grown government. And growing government and increasing government spending has reduced the growth of our economy. We've seen a 0% increase in our GDP over the last 30 years. So right to work will drive people into the private sector, it will drive investment into our economy, and will allow us and the people in this room who are builders, uh, job builders, to do what we've done, grow our base of work, drive investment, and that's what we need in this state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we move on to question number three. This question is for Steve Obsidnik, David Stemmerman, and Bob Stefanowski. Rising health care costs rank as a top priority for Connecticut residents in this election. Health care costs continue to rise, although the rate of growth is slow. Higher costs affect everyone, individuals, employers, and government. 
the share of health care costs paid by employees is climbing as businesses struggle to manage the increases. In 2018, employees pay for 44% of their health care costs, up 10% from 2018. What proposals do you have to address rising health care costs, and why do you support them? Steve Obsidnik, two minutes. Yeah, I think the governor's biggest impact on health care costs is Medicaid. We spend about $3 billion a year on Medicaid in this state. And um, we have to address that because that drives the cost of health care in the state of Connecticut. We all know what we deal with, which is the size of co-pays going up, premiums, uh, pharmaceuticals. When you look at Medicaid, what we have to drive is competition of getting folks from the Medicaid world into the private sector. That's what drives uh, job growth of 300,000 jobs. The private sector is the best vehicle by which I've seen that can drive and manage health care costs. So that's why it's critical that we move people from a welfare system into uh, uh, jobs. That's number one. Number two, we have to be much more innovative in how we deliver health care in this state. Indiana and Massachusetts are being very innovative. They're applying for CMS waivers, 1115 waivers, to take more control within the state to be creative on how you can deliver health care at a better cost point. Number three, why are we the only state that self-administers our Medicaid program? We have state workers administer it. Every other state, 49 states, outsource it to an Aetna or United Healthcare. When you do that, that drives about 20% efficiency gains across those states. That's $500 million. To me, that's a large number. So we need to bring more innovation, create more jobs, drive people to the private sector. Private sector delivers health care uh, at a better price point, And we need to be more creative with government and get government out of the pro process of me administering Medicaid. That's the innovation we need to drive uh, our economy, get people better health care, so people can actually build their family, build their career, and retire with dignity in Connecticut again. Thank you. David Severman, two minutes. We talk about health care, there are three goals that we want to achieve, whether it's for business or for Medicaid, which is access, quality, and affordability. Those are the three magic qualities. This is an area that I actually know a bit about. As uh, I talked to you about my business, uh, I started myself, so I was paying premiums uh, and needing to make choices for my business, like many businesses here. And we invested in all kinds of businesses in this sector. Uh, the, we happen to have, as people may or may not know, uh, the leading companies in what was called managed care. Uh, a long time ago, they didn't do much managing of care, uh, but I believe that in partnership with them, we can have our cake and eat it too. What does that mean? If you look at where we are today, we as a command and control approach from the government are insisting upon a series of mandates, and we're insisting that the government manage health care. I believe that what the government should be doing is creating a partnership with business to improve quality, which will then reduce costs. A perfect example of that is in the area of prevention. Another perfect area is in providing more information. When you put those two things together, what happens? What happens is that whether you are somebody in a private sector health plan or somebody in a Medicaid program, you know about your health. You have a partnership with your care providers, so you prevent illness before it occurs. That results in a reduction in, in illness and a reduction in cost. Uh, the last piece that I would put out here uh, is that this is an area where we have a great potential to grow our own business. We have Aetna here. We have Cigna here. We have Optum here. These can be some of our great employers. When we work together in partnership with them, not only will we reduce our costs for health care, but we can grow an industry and grow jobs here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bob Stefanowski. So I think it starts with reducing the overall cost of health care. I mean, as business owners, you know, the cost of health care is choking businesses. Even a, when I was at GE, even a massive company like that, the amount of health care cost was just choking uh, our ability to fund growth, our ability to create jobs, and our ability to, to uh, really drive things. Um, and we do need to take care of people that need it. Um, but our entitlements in this state are out of control. Um, there's no accountability. Uh, we spend more than most states on, on everything we do, and the service is less. So I'll echo what, what my two colleagues said, is we got to get the private sector more involved. 
99 times out of 100, the private sector is better at running something than the government is. Get the government out of the way. We need to give people more choice in their health care benefits. We need to be a, people to be able to go outside the state of Connecticut and look at plans that are not within our borders. We need to provide competition. We need to work with the doctors. We need to work with the pharmaceutical companies. The prescription drug um, are out of control. I remember growing up, if I had a headache, my mom would pick me out of bed and said, go to school. <laughs> right? What are you getting out of? You get a pill. The whole culture of this society, pain management, prescription, one drug after another, it is absolutely choking business. So how do we fix it? More choice. We can't count on that Medicaid funding from the federal government being there forever. It's here now, but we don't know how long it's going to last. And when I talk to small and mid-sized businesses around this state, they want certainty. They want to know they're going to have a level playing field so they can plan. And right now, health care costs are way too volatile to be able to plan anything. So it's a combination of all those things we've got to get cost down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to question number four. Um, you may note that we don't, we won't have a, after I read this question, we don't have a question um, surrounding taxes. And in our Legislative Action Committee, we had a rather spirited discussion about that. And the conclusion we have is, is that we have to talk to these candidates about taxes. We might want to question why they're actually running. We certainly know that that is the, the most important issue, and we expect them uh, to address that. So in their closing statements, if they'd like to uh, address that as well, they can. So our fourth question is for Joe Gannam, Oz Griebel, and Mark Bowden. Um, as you know, the governor does not work in a silo. The governor is required to build a collaboration with many different constituents, especially our General Assembly. So with you as our governor, what will be different in working with our General Assembly? How will you work with our legislators to make sure that we have a business-friendly environment in Connecticut? Joe Gannon. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. Th thanks. Thanks for the. Can you hear me? I'll give you a new one. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for the question. Um, look, this is going to be, as you, as you get into it, probably one of the most important litmus tests for whoever the next governor is. And we can all hail that we're the chief executive and so on and so forth. I'm there now, I do it every day. But the truth is, you have to have the ability to work with a legislative body at the very least in order to accomplish anything. Flashback, only a few months ago, we saw the debacle of the separation between executive and well, that whole morass that put Connecticut in a position where we couldn't get a budget passed for months and months and months, the embarrassment to the whole country. Now, I love the private sector experience and, 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 the, and the theoretical approaches to how they fix the problem from afar, and that there's no challenge to come from the business community into running the delicate three three-level chessboard of, of, of government. Well, I've been there, done that, have been doing it with results. Not only on a local level with it, which is certainly a much smaller legislative body, but with this General Assembly, with tangible results on things that are important. Whether it was an approach that didn't ask the state for more money, but asked for permission to restructure a pension plan for our largest city so that we could save on an annual basis millions of dollars and maybe some 20, 30, 40 million dollars over the life of of, of pension system there for un, unfunded challenges which most of our major cities in our state has. Experience with that. But results with bipartisan leadership and the house, uh, bipartisan support from some of the leaders in the House and the Senate. Ultimately had a little, uh, and then of course the governor had to sign off on it as well. With other important business uh, friendly initiatives to save energy. If I won't know what this is, but one of ours is an environmentally community, an old gritty uh, uh, city, certainly urban city, a thermal loop to provide carbon, zero carbon footprint energy for our downtown. Innovative in this part of the, this part of the country, even nationally. Bipartisan support to get that passed in the General Assembly. And others, uh, the list goes on. So that track record of understanding how dynamic Thank works. you very much. Thank you. Oz Griebel, two minutes. Thank you. You start with the uh, bone deep respect for every individual. Uh, we're campaigning today to win on November 6th. Campaign to change Connecticut starts on November 7th, and that means sitting down with the then elected uh, members of the legislature, their 2022 seats that are up for election, bringing the caucus leaders in as soon as they're identified, and start the discussion even before the inauguration about what the key elements of that budget need to be. Having people at the table on a regular basis, 
making sure that the private sector is engaged in those discussions, so it's not just a legislative interaction, but also, as I say, private sector leadership, and understanding that we have unions uh, that have to be part of this discussion as we go forward. The fundamental uh, point of this, of, of Monty and me, and the way we deal with issues, and the way I've dealt with them at the Metro Hartford Alliance, is understanding if you're going to move something forward, you need all the right people at the table, you need to have a thick enough skin to have your own ideas criticized. Because if the idea, the, the best idea, no one has a monopoly on all the good ideas. If you're not willing to sit in the room and have the debates, have the food fights over the ideas and not the personalities, you won't get to the best solution. So to me, it does start with fundamental respect for all the uh, relevant parties and making sure that they're in the room and that they're being listened to uh, as we go forward. Certainly on the budget, as we said, uh, we're all saying it's the single most important document that we'll submit in February is that, is that budget document. I'm going to take a minute or 30 seconds, whatever I have, on the tax issue. I don't believe we can reduce the personal income tax in this next biennium budget. We didn't get into this mess in 10 minutes. We're not going to get out of it in 10 minutes. And the idea of lowering taxes to me is going to have to be done over an extended period of time. I do believe we can get rid of the business entity tax uh, in the first budget, and I think we ought to look very seriously at eliminating the gift and estate tax, which was one of the recommendations that came out of that commission. I think that's something we can do to send a strong signal to those with wherewithal that we're serious about making this a place where we do want successful people to stay, to not only pay taxes, but can support philanthropies and contribute their intellectual capital to various organizations. Thank you. Mark Bowden, two minutes. Thank you very much. It's as the only member, or the only person up here on the stage that's actually been a member of the legislature, um, I understand the process. And I respect the process as a co-equal branch of government. We've got two great legislators here with us, Whit Betts and, and uh, Senator Martin. They fight every day to put their finger in the, in the dike that's leaking of new crazy ideas that come out of the current group of legislators. When you have a Speaker of the House that is a union organizer, things are never gonna go well when that legislature is in session. The Republicans will be scrambling, and the ideas, the anti-business ideas come out again and again and again and again. That's why the worst thing that we can have is a full-time legislature. There are people up here that have suggested we have a full-time legislature. Why would we promote a bunch of people who have buried us in debt and bad union deals and made one of the worst business environments in the United States of America? It's absurd. We're trying to cut the growth of government lower the growth of government, and, and certainly focus our legislature on dealing with the problems in front of them. As mayor of the city of Danbury, we're one of the most diverse cities in the state of Connecticut. We're the 12th most diverse city in the United States of America. We have 59 different languages spoken at our high school. I bring disparate groups of people together all the time as stakeholders, sit them down, talk to them about our challenges, and find consensus on the issues of the day. I'm not afraid to compromise. But one thing is a takeaway from here that you should have is I will never compromise on my principles. That's what a good leader does, and that's how I'm going to lead the state of Connecticut. Thank you very much. Um, candidates, thank you very much for your insights, your ideas, and vision. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause. For our We certainly would like to make, to make you available uh, to the members of the business community as the forum wraps up. So please, you know, be, uh, you're more than welcome to stay uh, and engage with the members of our business community. We're going to give you an opportunity for closing comments. You will have one minute um, to uh, make your closing comments. And again, we will go in reverse order of the opening comments. So we will start with Mark Bowden. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's my honor today. It's my honor and privilege uh, to be here this morning with you, and I look forward to continuing this discussion about issues that face the state of Connecticut. But I want to tell you something: that each day, when I wake up and I walk into my office, I work for 85,000 residents. That's my boardroom. And when I'm governor of the state, I'll be working for 3.2 million residents. That'll be my boardroom. So it's critically important that we understand that there's different skill sets in being able to lead these kinds of organizations and to find consensus within the communities. I'm proud to have led one of the best run cities in the state of Connecticut. When I'm governor of this state, we will once again be the envy of Connecticut. 
the place that all of you remember, why you came here, why your parents came here, your great-grandparents, whatever. The place to plant a flag, to grow here, to buy a home, and to retire here. God bless you, and God bless our America. Thank you very much. Bob Stefanowski. So thanks very much for having me. Um, our state is in an absolute crisis. And if you honestly believe that putting another career politician in to correct the problems created by career politicians, then I'm not your guy. You shouldn't vote for me. Uh, I am a business person. Um, I was a senior guy at GE. I ran a $500 billion business as CFO at UBS. I know how to negotiate. I know how to build alliances. I know how to cut costs. And I know how to deliver on a plan. We will rip costs out of this state like you've never seen. We'll use it to fund a tax cut. We'll use it to get rid of the state income tax over eight years. We'll use it to reduce corporate taxes. We will use it to do the exact opposite of what Dan Malloy has done in the last eight years. Give money back to people. Give money back to companies. Get the jobs growing. Get people to want to be in Connecticut again. Start to play offense and make this place what it used to be. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. David I'll take your invitation to talk about taxes again. So I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts when it was called Taxachusetts, and it was losing families and businesses just like ours. And the land of Elizabeth Warren now has lower taxes than we do, and the logo of GE is now in the uniform of the Boston Celtics. I view that we have to cut our taxes, but what we need is an honest and realistic plan to do so. We have two candidates here who have said that we can eliminate the personal income tax. I view that as the same kind of empty promise, making promises you cannot keep with money you do not have that's gotten us to where we are today. Those plans have been called anything from unworkable to preposterous. Our plan has been recognized as being bold and achievable. We run the math. We will provide a tax cut for everyone that is paid for by, ta by cuts in spending and getting rid of special deals in the tax code. That's the kind of specific, achievable plan and honesty that you need from your next governor that I will provide. Thank you very much. Steve, All submariners are trained firefighters, and Connecticut's on fire. And we all need to run to this fire and address these challenges head on. To do that, you deserve a leader who has the experience, plan, and character to actually put out that fire with you. So, I grew up in this state. I served in the military in this state. I've created the good, high-tech paying jobs that we need here in this state now more than ever. My detailed plan focuses on targeted tax reduction, day one, for seniors, businesses, and for working people. My plan talks about taking $3.5 billion of detailed cost spend spending out day one. It talks about building career corridors, innovative ideas to leverage all the assets and the strengths that we have. And that's what your leader needs to do. Walk and chew gum at the same time. Fiscal stability is the walking, and inspiring us to build jobs is the chewing gum. That's what you deserve. Look, I look forward to earning your vote on August 14th if you're a Republican, and in November if you're not. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. Uh, Cindy, Paul, everyone, thanks for putting this on. Just a quick thing, no matter, it's a great opportunity, but to answer some of these questions in two minutes is pretty challenging. So I welcome the opportunity to have an extended discussion at your places of employment uh, with your colleagues where there can be much more of a back and forth. But again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. The last thing I just say is that Cindy mentioned that you'll be, she'll be on the governor's doorstep. You won't have to worry about that. I'll be calling Cindy on November 7th to set up meetings right away. If we don't have that engagement with the private sector on a sustained basis, we won't earn your trust, we won't earn your confidence that you'll keep the job you have here today and the next job you have will be here. That's only going to occur with a sustained dialogue, listening to what your needs are, and making sure you know what we're advocating for so that you in turn will advocate with your state senator and state legislators to move to make some of the structural changes. Just because we get elected on November 6th doesn't mean the change that we're advocating will happen without your, without your sustained engagement. So I thank you for the opportunity look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you very much. Joe Gannon. Thanks for the opportunity. I guess I'm the last to speak, but thank you. And as business leaders, people that, individuals and entities that provide jobs, create jobs, and are committed to Connecticut, thank you for that. My background, I think, in public service is uh, extensive and well-known. And I offer today, uh, as I have locally with our Bridgeport Regional Business Council, a partnership with government. That's the best way to get things done. When business leaders partner with government officials and understand the dynamics of the problems, 
and have the wherewithal and the commitment to make the hard decisions to get things done the right way to fix Connecticut. I've taken a fiscal mess before in our largest city, put that city back on track while holding line on taxes with growth and support for businesses reestablishing their confidence in that community. We can do it for Connecticut as well. I look forward to the opportunity, certainly the challenges, but the opportunity to help to build a better Connecticut that works for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Again, ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause. So to wrap things up, I'd like to welcome back Cindy Bombard, the President and CEO of the Central Connecticut Chambers of Commerce. Cindy? Just have to find my notes. Paul stole them. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors um, and also Not Med Television. In back of your brochure, the airing time for public access is there. Please share it with all of those that could not be here today. But I want to thank all of our sponsors, Webster, Connecticut, United Bank, Bristol Hospital, Tungsten Community College, D'Amato Construction, Farmington Bank, and Nutmeg Television. Without each of your partnerships, programs like this are not possible. And I would also like to thank Paul Lavoie, Kurt Bowers, and our timekeeper, Chris Boyle. Again, thank you so much. And I would like to introduce the chamber staff because um, they are really the strength behind a lot of this. So we have Jen, Katie, Jill, uh, and Jennifer are here with us this morning. Thank you so much. And we have Sue Sadecki, who is our past chair, who is here. But I'm going to give all of our candidates for governor my card, because when you, one of you, get elected, I want to be invited to your inauguration. <laughs> and uh, you can count on the Central Connecticut Chambers of Commerce to help you with getting out of where we're at. We are, are, we will assist you. And I see Tim Herbst came in late. Tim, thank you. I know you were at another program this morning, so I have my card for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.